Hello and welcome to this Addo Chat with myself, Lana Will, Addo's Program Manager, and we've got Kate Kendall here in the hot seat, the founder of Addo, here to chat all about stuff Addo and what's happening in 2022. Uh, it's been a very weird few years for everybody and uh, we've had some changes at Addo as well and we're excited to chat, let you know what's happening at Addo, more about uh, the mindset of Addo founders and um, the community of Addo as well and then a bit about some Addo programs as well. So let's just kick into it. Hey Kate, welcome. Um, as always, we'd love to hear you summarize your amazing experience in the startup industry and uh, your experience as a female founder and creating the Atto community. Yeah, well, thanks again for hosting this today, and I'm excited for the year. So a lot of people come to Addo, and maybe they have never, uh, you know, heard about what I've been up to in the past. So it's always good to just give a little recap. So I'm a startup founder myself. I have founded four companies now. Um, I was an ex-business journalist originally and didn't really even know what an entrepreneur was um, when I was growing up. And uh, then I started hosting a lot of events early in the Melbourne startup um, ecosystem where I'd bring people together over coffee mornings and things like that and got to know a bunch of people working on really cool things and realized that I could create a company too and work remotely. So often it was driven why I started companies by wanting flexibility and freedom in my life, which we see a lot of that in Addo founders too. It's not necessarily like I want to go out and create a company that's a unicorn and sell off the sunset with billions of dollars. It's more like, how can I make my life better now? Um, so I created a first company, the fetch.com. And that was kind of where everyone went to find out what was going on in the startup ecosystem, business, creative and more um, and crowdfunded on Kickstarter for that. So the reason I share that is because I've had a variety of different funding um, journeys as well. Um, and then after that, founded a freelance marketplace called cloudpeeps.com um, and then raised about a one million US seed round from leading angels, both in the US. I was based in the US for seven years in New York and then San Francisco. Um, and then through that experience, I realized I was on this hamster wheel of kind of, you know, growth at all costs model where you have to keep grow, grow, grow. Um, and also at the same time as considering how, you know, if I wanted to start a family and things like that, how that would work. And I found the ecosystem quite um, insular and a bit of to like toxicity in knowing what path to take. So I started championing the Indie Way, started a company called Indie Labs, which uh, then created Addo Accelerator out of and raised grant funding for um, to start championing a different way to build it, building companies and building startups and helping the next generation of female founders so they didn't they don't have to go quite through the experience I went to where I felt like I had to choose startups or no startups um, or family, you know. Um, and then we started in 2019 and it's been an incredible couple of years. Uh, we were one of the world's first remote accelerators um, that existed prior to COVID and then now everyone's remote. So um, we've had a lot of learnings there too, but um, happy to dive into a bit more if needed too, Lana. Amazing. Thank you so much for that epic summary, Kate. Uh, I love learning from someone like you who has that experience as a founder and has the range of funding experience as well. Like it's so valuable for our founders to know that there's not one way to do something because uh, a lot of people do champion uh, raising funding and raising money from venture capitalists as well. So it's very awesome to hear from someone firsthand those differences as well. So uh, you said it started in 2019 and maybe you could just take us through the evolution of Atto a little bit more. So what happened the first year and now we're in the third or fourth year and uh, what's changed over that time? Yeah, so the first year we ran an accelerator program that had a few, uh, you know, we had an offline demo day pre-COVID. It was a smaller batch size um, and it started with uh, a lot of kind of uh, weekly workshops, but not as many um, events within the program itself. And each program now seems to be getting bigger every year and we like to keep it still focused. Um, and the second year we ran another accelerator and um, uh, we've also now run a third accelerator. So we've got three batches that have been, I'm thinking 2019, 2020, 2021. <laughs> and now in 2022, we've decided to actually evolve our programs depending on the founder's stage. So what we noticed that we were still getting a lot of early stage founders through Atto, but different needs. So you might have had someone who was really focused on looking at funding their startup, taking those next steps, scaling out their team. 
a little bit later stage and then people who are coming with a you know no real solidified idea um no real kind of landing page or domain or anything like that registered so so really at that early um stage steps and taking those first steps for their company uh so that's why we've launched um really split them into the pre-acceler and an accelerator and we'll discuss more of those uh, differences uh, later on today as well. So we'll be kicking off Addo Aspire um, and then Addo Accelerator. And of course we have our Academy membership, which launched last year, which Lana was a huge part of. Um, so that's been going well now for 12 months time. And that's a really great intimate focused community of female founders, um, you know, scaling their startups day in, day out, going through all of the challenges that it, uh, are there you get from just even building a company. So it's an incredible community support. Yes, I completely agree. The community is second to none, that's for sure. And yes, it was amazing to join the Addo team last year and help with the launch of the Addo Academy. Uh, Kate casually had her second baby while also <laughs> running all of these companies and all of the things as well. Um, so it was really great to see um, how you handle that juggle and how you speak about that open and honestly with the community as well. And yeah, the alumni are just so amazing and so inspiring. Uh, Addo has supported over 70 founders so far, and we're always looking to support more female founders, like both on our social channels with our content and within our community too. I was just thinking we should touch a bit on uh, what is a startup as well, because I, mm. I find a lot of founders don't really know the definition of a startup. Uh, LaunchVic have their own definition, um, but I also um, quite like the tech enabled term as well, but then there's also like business versus company versus startup. How do you define a startup, Kate? And what do you think a tech enabled business is? Yeah, so I'm a bit of a purist when it comes to the term startup itself, because that kind of arose out of Silicon Valley, a lot of businesses that had the ability to scale to millions or billions of users quite quickly, and they had a scalable business model. So these companies um, are quite different from what you'd consider, you know, a small business, a small business, which is uh, largely dependent on the number of people to scale. So they scale through people, not technology. Um, and obviously people like Peter Thiel, Paul Graham, a lot of these people that have been talking about startups for a while have that definition of a startup too. Um, and then recently we've seen the word startup, you know, be completely used now to define any art of creating a new business. So if you're creating, you know, a hot dog stand that can be considered like a food startup or whatever. Now you're starting an interior design business, you might call yourself like a lady startup um, and those kind of things. So I see the term uh, be widely used now. And I think that's great because anyone getting into entrepreneurship is is a good thing. Um, but what I particularly like to see is people who get into entrepreneurship that have the ability to take these businesses and really change the world. And, you know, not only economically empower themselves, but also, you know, bring people along with them. So really change, change the world. Um, and that's why I still see a tech enabled business or a business that can scale through technology or has the ability to go on to become a unicorn or a billion dollar company valuation. It doesn't have to be, um, but they're really kind of shooting for the stars. I tend to use the word indie company a lot here, and we can talk a little bit more about the indie way, but that also shows that you can, you know, still have um, a scalable business model. You can still go big, but you don't have to be, you know, the level of Amazon or those kind of companies. You can still be a company that is doing very well and um, that's tech enabled. And at Addo, we like to see businesses that, um, you know, a product focus. So you might have a business and you might be running an agency or a services business. There's a lot of programs out there for those kind of companies, but we're really focused on how can you create a tech product to scale your idea out? And that's, uh, that to me is all about what startup land is. Amazing. I love this mentality. Obviously, um, I consider myself a practical cheerleader of female founders. And uh, it's actually proven that uh, women who start businesses um, provide uh, more economic benefit and social benefit for their communities when they do as well. And I think they really align with this indie way of doing things as well. So maybe could you tell us about the indie way? What, do, what does that mean? Yeah, so it was through building Cloud Peeps that I noticed, you know, okay, there was one pathway to success, which was raise as much money as possible and try and get in tech crunch and hire as many people as possible and work as many hours as possible. Like that was the kind of um, way of company building. So what I started doing is chatting to a lot of comp uh, companies and founders, CEOs that had taken a little bit of a different uh, pathway. So maybe they bootstrapped and still got into hundreds of millions in revenue, companies like Basecamp, 
uh, 37 signals. Or maybe they had actually raised money and then decided that that pathway wasn't for them. So people like Joel Gascoigne of Buffer and Gumroad, they've been very, um, you know, championing that you can actually change the course of your path once you are on it. Um, and so I just started researching a lot and then looked at what it is, uh, how those companies change. So say even if you are not raising money, then you're not really going to attract people to your company in terms of uh, stock options because you might never want to exit your company. You might not be just looking for a quick flip. You might be building a company that you want to work on for life. So I started a series of kind of things that I, I view as differentiators of um, indie companies. And one of them is, you know, that they focus on profitability versus growth. So it's something where it's okay to grow and be pos uh, profitable and that, that they're not on the, you know, opposite edges of the coin that you can actually create a company that's scalable and profitable. Um, the companies that focus on sustainability versus fast exits, companies that look at, you know, smart headcounts. It's not about uh, just getting as many bums on seats as possible to, to say that you've got, you know, a thousand people working at your company. And the, I'm not opposed to raising capital, but it's a way to do it mindfully. Like you might, you know, raise capital, but do it in controlled amounts where you can kind of retain ownership or really, you know, choose to work with investors or people that are on your path that are aligned with your path and you don't just get into some sort of messy situation. Um, and then also companies that really, really, really are obsessed with customers. You know, it's not always about press mentions. It's, they might be quiet. They might be founders that you don't see talking much on Twitter or, uh, you know, publicly, but they're building really, really great companies that are obsessed with customer value. Um, things like profit sharing versus stock options. And, you know, they're really thinking of scaling globally. So these indie companies are still operating globally. They're still going big, but they, you know, are just kind of really um, mindful about how they do that. And, and, you know, all in all, they, it paves the way to have inclusivity as well and a more diverse um, team because you're not just kind of trying to be the Mark Zuckerberg clone that, you know, traditional investors will go, oh, you know, you're the 22 year old founder who's sleeping in a bunk bed eating ramen in Silicon Valley, like you're going to be amazing. It's much more open to seeing, you know, that anyone can be an entrepreneur and anyone can create immense value. Mm. So many amazing points about an indie company. Thank you so much for summarizing them, Kate. Um, every time you speak, I learn something and it's so fantastic. I really want to highlight the point about uh, speaking with your customers and being customer focused versus press focused as well. Like um, me, myself, having a marketing background and yourself as well with your journalist background, I think it's so easy to talk about doing the work versus actually doing the work. And in Atto, we definitely encourage founders to speak to uh, their customers from uh, before they even build something, you know, so you've, you've really got to prove and validate uh, what you're building before you build it and get that feedback really early on. So you talked a lot about the indie way and the evolution of Atto as well. And could we maybe just break down a bit more? How is Atto different to the many other accelerators out there? Why would people, why would female founders choose Atto over anybody else? Yeah, well, see, this is something that I still ask myself every day because when Atto started as well, there weren't really any remote accelerators. Not many people were focused on even female founder accelerators and those kind of things. And there's been an explosion in the space. But the reason why Addo was started is because I wanted to help people unlearn a lot of the, the kind of myths of Silicon Valley or startups in general, which is, you know, you must always have a co-founder. You must always have a technical co-founder. Um, you must always raise as much money as possible. You know, all of these things that you kind of get taught or told by the majority of the startup community, sometimes it's not the reality, you know, and it's, it's, really existing to kind of create a path that you can do your company on your own terms and you don't need permission, you don't need gatekeepers, you can join the Addo community and start now. There's nothing stopping you from, you know, this very evening doing something to, to get your idea out there. And so um, I still think that there's a huge place for just that mentality in the community. A lot of programs are also based on equity. So if you wanna, you know, go down the pathway of raising money, that's fantastic. But if you don't, the, a lot of accelerator programs just don't make sense because you have to give away equity to do them. So that was also a huge part of just starting Addo and gives people flexibility to decide or just taste a little bit of what an accelerator is like before they might um, commit more. The other thing is a lot of um, people will expect you to be full-time on your startup. And um, that for me, when I started to fetch, I had a part-time job. I was working as a, a marketing manager for a travel startup. 
And uh, that allowed me to actually work on my startup because I had to have a source of income. And that's, again, breaking down those privilege cycles, all of that stuff. You know, traditionally, a lot of people might not have even been able to enter the startup ecosystem if they have to go, you know, quit their job and go full time and things like that from day one. So there's a quite a few little bits that we are different, but I think a lot of it's a, a mindset thing. And then also, you know, it started by founders for founders. Um, this is something where, you know, I really like helping the next generation of female founders have always been passionate about supporting the community. Um, this isn't something that we're doing, you know, as uh, people coming in as, um, I guess, employees wanting to get the, the paycheck to just, you know, sit there and run programs. We, we are really passionate about what we're doing. And I think that is evident in the kind of support that we help. If you join an ADO program, you literally are getting Alana and I help you personally. It's not layers upon layers and, you know, you might get five minutes um, with the team. You know, you're really getting our heart and our soul and our time into helping you build your startup. Amazing. And let's talk about building a startup as well. Those first early stages, like it's such a whirlwind for so many people. Um, we've had people who have been working full time and participating in the programs with like flexible lunch hours and stuff like that. We've had people working part time. We've had people who are building consultancies and they are trying to scale that with technology. And then we've had people who are trying to do this full time as well. So there's so much support that's needed in the early stage of the startup of a startup. Um, what would you kind of uh, say, how would you summarize that journey in the first couple of years? There's so many things um, that founders need and Atto offers quite a few of them as well with coaching and masterminds and community and education and things. But from your perspective, what do founders really need in those early years? Well, I think it all gets down to your product market fit and your customer validation. And it doesn't really matter what length of time that you've been working on your startup or uh, that, that process never goes away. And really at Atto, we reevaluate your business or your idea and get it down to what value is it providing um, to someone and, and will, are people willing to pay for it? Can this scale? Can this be tech enabled? You know, a lot of those assumptions that people make in their business, uh, they come back to bite them years later because they've never really broken it down and validated their idea properly. So even though there's a variety of pathways that you can do that, you know, you can have lots of different types of events and support. I think it's about the focusing on what's really important at that stage. So, you know, founders might come up and say, oh, I've got a great idea for partnerships or I'm, you know, thinking about going to press and all of these things often don't matter if you don't have product market fit and you're not building something that uh, people want. So that's where I think a lot of the biggest support we offer is just the, the honing in on the idea, the validation, the, the direct coaching, the direct advisory, um, the supportive community that goes alongside that. And, you know, there's a different event for everyone. So if you learn better from like a group environment, the group environment is very popular. If you like one-on-one -on -one coaching, you know, people get a lot out of that too. If you like reading updates in our online platform where there's a lot of resources posted and, you know, things that you can watch later, that's a way too. So I think it just depends on the type of founder, but all in all, it's about focusing on the right things at the right time and not getting too distracted. Yes, we haven't uh, said that phrase yet, but focus, clarity and action are three major values at Atto and that's what we try and bring everything down to. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I think uh, one of the first things that founders should do in the early stages is try and understand themselves, how they learn, how they action things as well. Do they need to be accountable to others or to themselves? Do they work better in Asana or Trello or a spreadsheet or a Word doc? You know, it's good to understand these things about yourselves as well before you try and take action and then, you know, kind of lose momentum and then get gutted because you haven't done things in the way that you really wish you had so I really appreciate um, Atto's uh, kind of container for supporting founders in these different ways as well because I know um, uh, in the we've got Academy Masterminds every week as well and that's a, a huge huge drawing card for a lot of founders who want that weekly accountability as well but then people who have joined Atto for different reasons they joined to get some people have joined Atto straight uh, just straight away to get the coaching directly from Kate like that's the only thing they're joining Atto for, for because Kate is a very in-demand startup coach and she will mm -hmm. tell, it, tell you how it is and give you the best advice to take action and then other people want, want the community other people want the education and other people want the uh, you know the like-minded support from the community which I just said <laughs> it's funny um, Lana because one of the testimonials recently was about how it was Kate's not out to make any friends and at first <laughs> I you know read it I'm like oh but you know in in a way if you want to you know join a program where we'll be focused it you know yes it's a supportive environment but 
it's not a yes, yes, yes environment. You know, when when things are needing to change or when you want that accountability, we'll be there to, to help steer you. So it's kind of like the gym, but we're serious about getting people fit, you know, startup fit. So it's not just, you know, putting on your yoga pants and going for coffee every day. It's if you actually want to make a change and get your idea happening, Addo is the place to do it. I love it. I love that. All right. So let's dive into what types of ideas Addo helps out with. So there's a huge spectrum of startups and so many different industries that startups are, are making massive, massive change in. But how would you summarize what Addo is looking for um, and who should apply to Addo programs? Yeah, so we have a, uh, in early on in Addo, we really focused on a few types of businesses and um, verticals just because of that was our domain expertise. So if you were running a marketplace idea or a SaaS business or something around e-commerce, you know, that's where straight away we can get plugged in and make stuff happen and have that insight. But really over the last few, a few batches, we've actually have everything from like agriculture tech, med tech, you know, there's quite a lot of ideas that are coming through NFTs, crypto. Um, so we've become a bit industry agnostic and um, platform agnostic as well. So we can help a variety of different um, people, but really I'd say any idea can now be turned into a tech enabled business. So if you're thinking about something and you know, you're not quite sure if it could be a tech startup, still apply or still approach us and reach out anyway, because we can help show successful examples of um, ideas or companies that have been created um, in similar spaces. So, uh, so really, I think it's, it's up to the founder to, to kind of help uh, come to Addo and chat about their ideas or ideas and we can help distill them. So really anything at the moment now we'd consider. Amazing. And yes, it's been so interesting. We have had our founders who have joined us with just an idea and then they leave our programs with a landing page or a MVP and customers and their first sales, um, or they might have an existing business that they've, you know, completely pivoted and changed mm. and, you know, made profitable by the end of their programs as well. So let's talk about some of the amazing alumni. So there's been over 70 founders who have been supported by our program so far. Who stands out to you, Kate, and what kind of attributes do they have? And like, why, why are they great companies? That's a really great question. And it's something that after each batch, I tend to ask myself, you know, what's it like? And I guess I was a bit naive when we started to start up school. And I think every student would go on to, you know, be A++. And every student, you know, is incredible. And I love to follow their journey. And I think everyone has been, you know, incredible with their journeys. But I do think there are a couple of standout um, type of um, companies that have been through Addo. So, in 2019, Aerobe is obviously a fantastic example of that. Hannon came to Atto. Um, she was working on another startup and she had an idea to create a circular economy marketplace. Um, because we champion no code tools and prototyping using low code solutions, uh, that was tested using ShareTribe and Instagram for promotion. And she got to about 25K in revenue just in the accelerator through that. And of course, she's gone on to raise. I think it's like 1.3 million from traditional angel investors and VCs. And then recently also got um, part of the Boosting Female Founder Grant of 400K. Um, then the next next batch, 2020, Bubble Tea Club were an amazing example that stand out. So Jenny and Pam, two co-founders, had an e-commerce idea, but were kind of brand new to the startup um, ecosystem. You know, So they hadn't really been exposed to any of these options. And through Addo, one of the, the courses or the modules that we spoke about was alt funding options and talking about platforms like virtual and uh, really helping them to see how they could scale. You know, I use the example of Dollar Shave Club to show this isn't just, you know, you're kind of shopping e-commerce. This could actually be, you know, a huge billion dollar opportunity here. Um, and I think a lot of traditional investors would have underestimated the bubble tea market and thought it was some sort of obscure thing. But straight away, we were like, this is so exciting. And then they managed to raise a large round of equity crowdfunding, about 1.6 on virtual million. And then uh, they've since gone on to raise uh, another 400K from the boosting female founders. And they have about 30,000 customers now. So incredible, incredible. And shows that you don't have to be a traditional tech startup to really scale in a tech startup mindset. Um, and then last batch, uh, Cool Points Club uh, really stood out for me. Just again, a co-founding team, uh, really incredible, just tenacity and really understood the space. So I was learning a lot about 
um, NFTs uh, and from the metaverse, Web3, you know, all of this stuff that's just coming out in the last year or so from the founders. And, you know, off half the time, the coaching sessions, I was like, wow, I'm just learning more than I'm offering. But that to me is like someone super passionate about the space that are raising a seed round now using NFTs and crypto. And, and um, I think that's super exciting. So, you know, each of those examples, you've got traditional VC, you've got alt funding with virtual equity crowdfunding, and now you've got um, NFT crowdfunding. So again, not many accelerators would even be um, open to those different pathways because venture capital likes it to be quite uh, linear. And then you build your round and round and round and round and you're not getting you know, non-sophisticated investors on board and that kind of thing. And then a couple of other quick examples of websites. So Isla is incredible founder working on a bootstrapped company. And uh, we really helped her learn how to just increase her prices and just say, go for it. You've got to increase your prices. And even just through those rounds of iteration on pricing and uh, launching a B2B offering, uh, she became profitable. So again, her whole timeline of creating her company has, has expanded because she's now profitable. Um, and then um, Coffee Roulette, Zove Beauty, you know, there's just quite a, a bunch of examples that have, have stood out, but really there's something um, for everyone. We've had all sorts of companies. So please go and look at our alumni list at forward slash startups on addo.vc for a full taste. Yeah, so all of the startups are listed. You can stalk the founders, look them up on LinkedIn, check out the websites, like them on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all the places that they are. Um, so that's atto.vc forward slash startups. Um, there's some super inspiring founders there. And also always on the blog, we um, hear our founders there too. So that's atto.vc forward slash um, news. And you can find some awesome stuff there as well. So we haven't touched on no code, which I think is a huge draw card for Atto as well. I uh, didn't know too much about no code tools. I was like, oh yeah, probably probably would still be really hard to make these no-code tools. And I've had such a great time getting an education about no-code tools and the power of no-code tools and what they can do for founders, especially in the early stages when you're just testing with customers. Kate, can you share your journey with no-code tools and what you think of them and how our founders use them? Yes, yeah, so I probably discovered no-code around 2017. I mean, these, um, you know, visual programming environments, these type of platforms, WYSIWYG type editors and that kind of thing have been around for decades, actually. And um, one of the examples I use of a no-code tool was actually Excel in Microsoft Excel. I mean, that is basically how a lot of startups have started in the past, but we just wouldn't call it um, a no-code tool. So really what no-code has shown me is that you don't get stuck if you don't have a technical co-founder or you don't have 50 or hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is to build you know a product um, via an agency you can get started today so you can easily rapidly test ideas out using apps like webflow glide bubble and and just give it a go and you can learn it yourself there's often an a kind of a, a point where it gets quite complicated, but for rapid prototyping, customer discovery, customer validation, Airtable, all of these tools, Typeform, they just help you get started and, and they can help you actually scale. There's been quite a lot of uh, companies that have scaled to even millions or in revenue using still no-code tools. So I think it's just it helps people realize that there's a whole new way to build a tech startup and it doesn't require you to go out there and learn to code or hire a technical co-founder if you're non-technical. Um, so it's changed. It's basically changed the way that anyone can ever do anything because it's it's super helpful. And a lot of them are very much um, affordable to get started. You know, a lot of them have free accounts. So again, if you've got an idea, marketplace idea, you could go to a platform like ShareTribe again this evening and go and do something and get it started and tomorrow launch you know your brand and uh, just try it out it's a very different journey than when I was starting out with the fetch you know didn't know how to scale the event discovery app so went and raised the equity crowdfunding to then hire a developer to build a custom app years later I replicated that in glide in you know about an hour um, then with cloud peeps again raised funding went and built the custom marketplace software and could have easily now launched and prototyped that in something like ShareTribe or white, white labeled marketplace platforms. So all of the things that I struggled with when I was building my tech startups is, is now, you know, they're out the window. You can, you can do it now for free, basically. So I think it's so exciting, especially for non-technical female founders. 
Yes, it's a huge um, sticking point in the industry, I think, as well. Uh, female founders who think they don't have the technical knowledge to take action and build something themselves feel like they need to find a really smart guy who knows how to code to build the app for them or fix up whatever they're building for them. So, yes, I am massively on board for the no-code uh, movement. It's so amazing. It's so inspiring what people have made with these tools as well. And that's just one piece of the education that we give at ATO with our programs as well. So let's dive into our programs in general. What do we... Uh, provide founders with and what kind of structure do our programs have to support these female founders in their early journeys? Yeah, so all of our programs are 100% online. So it means that you can be anywhere in the world to apply. We do tend to focus on the Australian New Zealand time zone at the moment. So uh, that's something to consider. We've had people apply from overseas and I'm like, are you happy to take a call at 3 a.m.? You know, so just uh, look at that. Um, and uh, we have a variety of different things throughout the week. So um, each week in the accelerator, we get an ADO educator in that can talk about a topic. Um, we call them the master classes. They're really these workshops, deep dives into a certain area um, and have a QA and a around them as well. So the people can um, just ask our educators anything they want. Uh, then we have the masterminds. These are sessions that are peer to peer, founder to founder sessions and these relationships that are built through those, I mean, they'll, they'll last you for life. Most of the people in their mastermind continue to talk well out of, well outside of the ADO formal program period. So that's really a fantastic way to build that community and to have that support from other founders in the same um, kind of space that you're at. Uh, we also do the one-on-one -on -one coaching. So there'll be uh, time, 30 or 60 minute sessions that people often book in with myself. Um, and then we have office hours that we regularly do with ex uh, experts and the amazing Addo teams such as Lana that you can ask if you've got a question about marketing, communications, accounting, legal. There's a range of people that you can book in uh, for. And then we've also had some of the community take on social hours and that kind of thing. Um, uh, throughout the program and our accelerator ends with our annual demo day that happens in um, de November, December each year where we invite investors um, from the community um, to judge the demo day and we have um, really you know quick pitches and you can kind of see uh, celebrate what the founders have been working on throughout the accelerator in the year um, and uh, yeah that's basically the program and we have an online community platform where you can go and access all your resources and ask a question or um, direct message people or anything that you need look at other profiles um, and that is asynchronous so you can do that whenever you want. Yes, there's so many resources on the platform that we share from external resources that help founders, but also all of the masterclasses uh, that have been recorded previously at Edo as well, which are so valuable in themselves. Um, I just wanted to touch on the uh, demo day as well. So all the demo days are recorded and they're on YouTube. So you can go back and watch previous years. Um, it's super inspiring to look at where founders have gone since then to now. And some people have joined Addo for the demo day for the exposure to uh, investors if they do want to raise capital. Where other people have used it as kind of like a, a signpost or, you know, like the goal to get to where you can talk about your business for five minutes and you can explain the problem, the solution, uh, your go-to-market strategy and that type of thing as well. So it's a very, very uh, important part of the Addo um, experience. And we also have these internal showcases as well. So um, not only do the founders meet at the masterminds and on our online community, but we provide the opportunity for them to share what they've been working on, share their lessons, and then support the community in that way as well. So I was just thinking, could we touch on some of the other successes that our founders have had post ADO? So what, what do we expect people to get once they leave the programs? What, what do we expect from them um, through the uh, programs themselves and then afterwards? I think it depends on the stage of the founder and where the founder's at. If they've got an existing business that might, you know, need help being tech enabled or they might, like we said, orbit or pivot, um, really through Atto, they should walk away with um, a pivoted business model at the end of it and a pivoted business. And we've seen quite a lot of those companies as well um, that have done well, just even go through Atto to kind of turn their business around and start scaling it. Um, and then if you're brand new, we're in a brand new idea and you're starting out, you're really going from just a feeling of what your company could be and who it could be marketed to and that kind of thing. Um, refine that down to, you know, have, have registered your company to um, creating your brand name, your domain name, 
uh, initial customer validation, you might have started to build a mailing list, get a bunch of customers on there, maybe even taken um, customer orders or started earning revenue. I mean, that's that's the kind of main goal. And then a pathway or a roadmap um, post addo to see what the next steps are. So that might be scaling out your product more. It might be looking for some uh, next step of funding to help fund the next part of your journey. So it really depends on the type of um, stage company um, that then the founder is at. Um, each person kind of comes with a different goal, a unique goal. They might be a similar stage, but they have different goals as well. So it just it depends on the founder. I love that. The classic answer, it depends, but it also is individual as well. So like there's no one right way to do it. And it all depends on what the founder wants and how big they want to go as well, which I, I really, really enjoy about Addo. So uh, who should apply to Addo programs? How would you summarize their kind of attributes and what they're, what they're doing right now? Yeah, so again, maybe it is a little bit, it depends, but we've had all sorts of applications from people who might be working full time, uh, people that might be uh, working full time for someone else, um, then people who might be working full time on their own business. I find if you've run a business before, maybe an agency or a small business, you've already got that um, you know, used to uncertainty and used to having no structure and all those kind of things when you first start working for yourself out of the way so you can really hit the ground running at a program like Addo. Um, people who have multiple ideas, it's great as well because you can help um, focus and, and look uh, through that. People who have a company that, you know, they might have gone to a certain level, but now they need help understanding how tech can help them scale further. Um, that's it. People who are new to the tech startup ecosystem in general and just want to network and, you know, really kind of plug in and hear what it's like um, authentically from people who have been in that community. So um, people who have been maybe stay at home parents and they're now looking to kind of create their next endeavor as well. So again, it really is uh, anyone who's looking to take that next step and use technology to, to follow through a big idea. Yes, and we do need diversity in the ecosystem as well. So it's wonderful to welcome people from all of these different areas as well. So thank you so much, Kate, for sharing all of your experience and expertise and for obviously starting Edo. I definitely appreciate it. I know the 70 plus founders in the community definitely appreciate it and our external community appreciate it as well. We've had feedback that they just love the content that we create as well and the inspiration that we can share for future female founders because we have a bigger mission to support uh, you know, women to build companies and the impact that's going to have long term on the world. So let's just talk a little bit about our next upcoming program, the Atto Aspire. How is this different from the previous accelerators that Atto has run? And um, yeah, tell us a bit more about this program. So uh, consistently in our previous programs, there are a few of the sessions were the most highly ranked and they were around you know, lean product, lean MVP, prototyping, customer discovery, idea validation. And uh, that's the time that most of the founders spend on. But a lot of the time throughout the program, that's what they get stuck on because they've got the idea, they need to discover who their customer's in, they need to discover what the business model is. And that all needs to happen before you can really build a product or you can go to market or you can you know, look at your funding strategy. You kind of need to figure out what you're doing. And so what we've done is really dived into that area and um, then spread it out so you, the founders through Aspire can really pr like spend more time validating their idea and conducting customer uh, research, surveys, all of that stuff that takes a long time before they take that next step when they really need to start investing, um, knowing that they're investing from a place of strength. So a lot of the other stuff that was less important for super, super early stage founders, we've now said, okay, that's not something you need to focus on right now. What you need to focus on is your idea, customer discovery, all of those things. Um, and uh, we've also shortened it to eight weeks. So you can go hard in a shorter period of time. And for people who have time commitments, that can often work better as well. So this program is a really great exploring uh, program. It's also a more affordable program for people who want to um, try, you know, get involved in tech startups and see how it goes. We also have scholarships, which people can check out as well. Um, and then the accelerator then, you know, if you've graduated from the Addo Aspire, it would make sense to go into the accelerator program, which is all then about scaling your idea for the customer acquisition, marketing, press, funding, storytelling, pitching. It's that next step 
that you're really getting to. So they now work in combination with each other. And if you're someone who's already kind of gone through that product market uh, fit stage and now you're looking at funding, the accelerator is a really good place to, to, to focus. So it's it's a really great um, differentiation. And even if you're still looking to go to a later stage accelerator or an equity-based accelerator like a Y Combinator afterwards, um, you can still do Aspire or Addo Accelerator as almost a pre-accelerator. They're equity-free. So they're programs that can help uh, get you to a funding-based program as well. Amazing summary. Uh, I just wanted to also touch on um, this program. So the idea is to define your problem, conduct the customer validation, build a lean MVP, which I really enjoy as well. What can you put out there in the world so you can start getting feedback from customers really early, start testing and ideally get revenue sooner rather than later, rather than waiting on other people. Uh, the power is in your hands with no code tools and we'll teach you how to do it. And then also uh, the program will end with an internal showcase as well. So we'll summarize all of the things that you've learned over the eight weeks and then you can showcase what you've actioned since then as well and perhaps your plans for the future after the uh, these two months um, intensive working together. Uh, amazing summary, Kate. Uh, any final words for us today? No, that's it. Thank you so much, Lana. It's been a really great conversation and I look forward to seeing more expressions of interest and applications from awesome founders. Amazing. Thanks so much.